the Quran is identifying a phenomenon that's problematic. People who have charisma, people who misuse religion in, spe in their speech, people who, when they're put in charge, they do corrupt things, and people, when they are reminded or ref or there they are confronted with critical speech they respond to that through izza and ism izza is high and mighty arrogance and ism is by committing further injustice it doesn't take a genius to understand just from this that if the Quran is telling you this is a, di a problematic dynamic, so A, to say, well, if I want to implement, if I want to be true to the Quranic prescriptions, if I want to, in fact, address what the Quran identifies as a problem, A, I must it must become an organizing principle in my society to guarantee the right of people to in fact direct critical speech to the unjust without suffering undue consequences. Because if Allah says it's a problem that these people when you tell them, fear God, when you tell them, in other words, you're doing wrong, their response to, me, to you is to commit further injustice. So, if you, we could say, oh, that's really interesting, okay, let, and let's move on, let's just ignore it. And this is exactly what Muslims have done. And repeat the, the silly discourse about well, you know, if you give counsel to an unjust ruler, do it in private, which is completely, clearly fabricated. I mean, it's, it's infantile that there are Muslims today that still think that the Prophet ﷺ actually said that, that when you try to correct an unjust ruler, do it in private. It's infantile. I mean, it, it, is, it blows my mind that there's still Muslims who are at, at that level but anyway, so if, but if we want this Quranic discourse to actually not just be rhetoric, not just be dictum, dictum meaning speech that has no impact, no consequence, no effect, if we want it to be meaningful, then what do we do? It is not just, it's not enough to just tell people, well, just be aware of it. What you do is that you dis deduct from it an organizing principle. What is the organizing principle? Processes, institutions that would ensure, A, that people can tell those in charge, ittaqillah, in using Quranic language, i.e., you're doing wrong. Why are you going to tell them, fear God? You, because you want to criticize them for doing wrong, right? But it is very unfair to say, do it at your own risk, which is the attitude of modern Muslims. They tell you, oh, the greatest jihad is a word of truth before an, a des an unjust ruler. Okay, yeah, it's a great jihad, but you're telling me, me individually, to bear the risk on my own, which is unfair. But so what happens is that everyone ignores the greatest jihad because people don't want to suffer the consequences. But if you don't want people to ignore the greatest jihad, what do you do? You do what the entire civilized world does. Create institutions geared, designed to enable people, if they so wish, to tell those in power, when they are unjust, 
and not suffer consequences. Because if the consequences, I'm going to be arrested and tortured, there is a man, this is a very famous incident. Mubarak was a Hajj, the former president of Egypt. This is a real story. It's not, it's not even exaggerated. He was a well-known man. He just passed, he passed away last year. So this poor man saw Mubarak at Hajj and he got it in my mind, he got it in his mind to just, he, he somehow got close enough to Mubarak to just say to him um, something to the effect of that he used to be ex-military, this man a part of the Egyptian army, and he said something to the effect that, uh, you know, there is so much corruption committed by the military, Siat uh, al-Rais, you know, O oh, Grand President, Your Majesty, whatever, Ittaqillah, fear God. That's all that happened. It was public, everyone was aware of it, it was reported in papers, everything. This man was promptly arrested by Saudi authorities, turned over to Egyptian authorities. He was jailed without charge from for 20 years until Mubarak was overthrown, okay? He was released in 2011 after Mubarak was overthrown. He appeared on a few Egyptian programs where he would told his story about how all he did was tell Mubarak at taqillah and he ended up being in prison for 20 years without charge. There were clear signs of severe torture on him, including part of his skull was collapsed because they have given him a head injury and it was clear that the head injury had, had not, had, had affected him because he was a bit, anyway. Uh, so he talked about how he was tortured, how he was, so on. So he's released 2011 when Mubarak is overthrown and then when Sisi launches his coup in 2013, this man is re-arrested. He's re-arrested, and then he died in prison. Just because he dared to tell Mubarak, Ittaqillah. So if someone comes and says, oh, I'm a pious Muslim, and this dynamic is okay with me, I say, you have betrayed the Quran. Because when the Quran gives me this refrain, it's not telling me, let people sacrifice themselves. It's telling me it is your obligation, you Khalid Abul Fadl, it's your obligation to work towards the creation of institutions that would allow this person to say what they said to Mubarak and not have their life destroyed in that way. That's what I'm saying. This is in other circles, Ya Alam. In other circles, what I'm saying is so elementary, it's a little bit embarrassing. I mean, in other circles, other people would say, yeah, so, okay, of course, obvious. It pains me that this is forward thinking in Islamic circles, because it's not. It's just obvious thinking. It's the ABCs of giving a text effect, of translating a text from principles to a program of action. 